Okay. Well, I think uh, we can go ahead and get started. If we have any uh, stragglers, no problem. They can go ahead and join in. Thank you again for uh, coming to Bad Elf's third webinar. Our summer webinar series is continuing this week. We will be discussing the topics of geodesy and GNSS. Uh, this is not going to be an in-depth class, but just a brief overview. Uh, so all of our users out there can have a little bit better understanding um, of all these intricate systems that make geodesy and GNSS what it is. So for today, I am going to be one of your presenters. My name is uh, Dr. Nicholas Smolovsky. I'm the director of GIS Solutions at Bad Elf. Uh, Co-presenting with me today will be Larry Fox. He is our Vice President of Marketing and Business Development. Uh, if you are new to one of our webinar series, we are glad that you could make it. If this is, uh, you know, second or third time you've been doing one of these, we're glad to see you again and welcome you back. Hopefully you've met one of us, uh, either through the phone or at a conference over the years. Uh, we should be familiar faces, and if we're not, please reach out. We would love to hear from you. So we're going to be hosting this webinar for you today. Uh, as we get going, I want to make a quick uh, comment that if you have any questions, please feel free to put the questions into the question chat box. Uh, we will be recording all of the questions and answering any questions you may have, uh, both at a short Q&A session at the end of this presentation, uh, but we will also be emailing a list of all of the answers to the questions uh, following up this webinar. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on uh, our Bad Elf YouTube channel and disseminated uh, along all the normal social media channels. Uh, if you do not follow us on social media, please go ahead and sign in while you're sitting there and uh, go ahead and follow our page on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and on Twitter. We'd love to uh, be able to communicate with you regularly. Okay, so on the agenda for today, we're gonna be reviewing a few things. So, what is geodesy? Uh, what is GPS and what is GNSS? These are terms that you'll hear often thrown around in the mapping industry. And if you don't know what any of these mean, don't worry, by the end of this you will. Or perhaps you've heard these and you think you know what you've been uh, uh, hearing, but perhaps you'll learn something new. We're also gonna be talking about how GPS and GNSS get sources of error. We're gonna be discussing improving accuracy uh, for uh, field data collection with GPS and GNSS. Additionally, we'll be talking about understanding the core concepts of what it means to have corrected global navigation satellite systems. Uh, specifically, we'll be talking about SBAS, real-time kinematics or RTK, post-processing, and L-band uh, corrections. We will be following up with managing and understanding collected data, and we will conclude with a quick Bad Elf hat contest. So um, if you are one of the lucky attendees, we will be selecting one attendee. Uh, unfortunately, we're gonna be doing it just for uh, within the United States, but we will be selecting one attendee and we'll be sending you a brand new, pretty sweet uh, fitted Bad Elf hat. So we'll be talking about that. So without further ado, let's jump into what is geodesy, GPS, and GMSS? Okay, so bear with me for just a minute. We're gonna be switching to a live screen. So hopefully all the technology works correctly. Hopefully you can see a whiteboard. I'm gonna be walking over to the whiteboard here. All right, so perhaps you didn't realize you'd be sitting in a classroom today for just a few minutes as we talk about uh, what geodesy, GPS, GNSS is, a couple key topics. Uh, so sit back, hopefully you'll enjoy and remember some of the years maybe you studied in high school or in college. Uh, we're going to start with what is geodesy? So if you have ever asked yourself, what is geodesy? Geodesy is the study of the Earth's measurements. Uh, you may notice that there is a keyword in there, geo, and geo absolutely refers to the earth, right? And so geodesy is going to be the study of the size, the shape, the length, 
um, all of the different properties of the Earth, how that Earth is modeled. So you may think to yourself, Earth is a circle. Well, you'd be sort of correct. Technically, we are a spheroid at a, a, a low accuracy kind of terminology. And the Earth as a spheroid can be better defined. So geodesy takes a spheroid and actually we've calculated out based on some really fantastic math, what we call a um, ellipsoid. So you may have a spheroid, we better define it as an ellipsoid. You may have heard of terms like ellipsoidal height. From here on out, know that ellipsoidal has to do with the model of the Earth. Uh, we can even get even more accurate than ellipsoidal uh, uh, shape and that's called using a geoid. And you may get something like this that looks like a geoid, and you'll notice that there are actually bumps along the surface of the geoid. Know that there are several geoids out there, 12A, 12B, 18, and pretty importantly, in 2022, here in the United States, we're gonna be getting a new uh, geoidal model for a coordinate system. You may be asking yourself, what are these bumps? And you may think to yourself, uh, the geoidal bumps are mountains. Uh, you'd be partially correct. Understand that geodesy doesn't only measure the earth and the shape and the length and the size, it also measures the gravity. And so these are actually gravity swells along that model, which we can get into a little bit more in deep detail later. But I want you to understand that geodesy is studying the earth, how the earth is shaped. Originally, geodesy was studied for navigation. So if you can imagine, uh, you had to you know, sail across a, a body of water or you were traveling right to a known location, you needed to know where you were going. And with rudimentary devices like compasses um, and, and you know, uh, latitude, longitude charts, you would have to navigate. So geodesy was the study of the earth for the purpose originally for navigation, right? And for building also. So you may be asking yourself, okay, so that's geodesy, that studies the earth's shape and size, right? So what is GPS? GPS actually stands for Global Positioning Systems, right? Or Global Positioning Satellites. It is a United States-based constellation of satellites. And so if you can imagine, we have the Earth and you have satellites floating synchronously around the Earth, providing positions down to devices like cell phones, GPS, et cetera. In the 60s and 70s, with the advent of this technology, the military put these satellites in space, and they communicate via radio signal, right? And so these radio signals are driven by atomic clocks that have very high accuracy and precision amounts of data collection, right? So we know exactly their time, we know their speed and all these different things. And so if you are on the earth, a GPS satellite can provide signals to your receiver. And so if you are a bad elf standing here with your new flex receiver, that receiver, we call it a receiver because it's actually receiving satellite radio signals. If you have four or more satellites, you can get a pretty decent position. Know that the more satellites you can capture and have information from, uh, normally the better your um, accuracy and precision of your point on the Earth. So that point right here, that X, Y, and Z, actually gets better with more satellites, right? And that's because it provides more information to the solution. So when you're out there collecting data, something to be always cognizant of is how many satellites are you tracking, right? And so in the flex, you'll notice for an example, we have a sky plot where you can actually look. And if you orientate the sky plot, which is up to north, you can see in the area which satellites you are collecting. Now, one thing to notice and note real quick is a side tangent. If you are next to a big old building, and that building is blocking the view of half the sky, know that the radio signals don't like that. And so if you're in a, what we call an urban canyon, an urban setting with buildings, or perhaps out uh, next to a big mountain, or even under heavy canopy trees, know that that will degrade a GPS signal. All right, so that's GPS very quickly. So you may be asking yourself, what is GNSS, okay? So GNSS, which actually in most cases today, we should be referring to not GPS. GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. So it's actually plural. GPS refers actually just to the US stations of satellite, or US constellation of satellites. 
when we talk about GNSS, it actually incorporates other systems. And so several other places on Earth have constellations of satellites now that provide position. Uh, Galileo from the European Union, uh, GLONASS uh, from Russia, and um, the Baidu system from China. Uh, and in fact, there's some other systems out there as well coming online every day. This is getting updated. Know that though, with GNSS, you're getting more satellites because you're tracking more constellations. Um, and in this case, this is pretty common. So you may have a misnomenclature. Just be careful. A lot of times people are referring to you're out in the field, what GPS is. Um, so we can be better than that. We know the difference now between GPS and GNSS. Okay. Okay. So another thing I want to mention quickly um, about GNSS, GPS is the concepts of accuracy versus precision. So this is pretty a complex thing when you're talking about the Earth and we're moving around very quickly in space and we're rotating and you've got gravity and we have all these different types of models. We have different types of things called projection systems and transformations and coordinates and units, right? All of these things play into this system of mapping. When we talk about how good a GPS is or a GNSS, we want to talk about accuracy versus precision. And the easiest way we can do it is we're going to draw out a bullseye. Pretend you're playing a game of darts. The, the goal of most games of darts uh, is to hit the bullseye and to close out stuff, right? And so if this is the bullseye right here, and you're out trying to get that position on the Earth, that X, Y, and Z, when that GNSS system like the flex collects that position, if it falls right on that X, that is what we would call high accuracy. If we went out there and we took a bunch of shots and we threw the dart with the flex over here several times, while this is all very clustered and close, notice that the accuracy, right, the absolute accuracy to the, the known location on Earth it's, it's larger, so this has low accuracy, but because we took several shots right here, the precision is actually very high. So the relative accuracy between each of these discrete shots is low, right? And so high accuracy, um, low accuracy, high precision. What if you had something like this? Well, this is the worst of both worlds. This is actually what we would call low accuracy compared to the known point. And we'd actually call this low precision because it's not clustered whatsoever. So these are a few basic concepts about geodesy, GPS, GNSS, accuracy versus precision, how these things work so that you can better understand how to use your high accuracy GNSS receiver. So we're going to switch back now into the presentation mode. For, so for just give me one second as we switch, bear with me. You should be seeing my screen again. And we're going to jump in now and start talking about sources of error. And uh, I'm going to be passing the mic over to Larry Fox. So Larry, uh, without further ado, uh, it's all you. And when you're ready, I can switch the screens for you. All right. Thanks much, Nick. I appreciate uh, all that explanation you had there. Uh, so Nick mentioned a few things about error, and uh, this is a slide that I love to show. Uh, there's a lot of sources for, uh, for error. I'm going to go just into a couple of these, but I wanted to kind of highlight a little bit about uh, all the places where you can get error in, in GNSS measurements. Uh, the biggest couple that we really have a lot of control over, as Nick mentioned, is multipath and what I would call user error. So let's talk a little bit about multipath. Uh, multipath is, as Nick mentioned, uh, situations where you're in urban canyons. And urban canyons can mean a lot of things. Uh, they could truly mean between buildings. Uh, they could be between you and large metal objects. They could be um, out in the field where you're literally in a canyon. Uh, G GPS or GNSS signals uh, like to take a straight path 
uh, for best results to uh, your receiver. So when you're thinking about making measurements with the GNSS receiver, the biggest thing that you're looking at is imagine if you're looking up at the sky and there were satellites floating above you. If you could see them directly, um, there's a good chance you'll get good signals. If there's a big portion of the sky that's blocked, uh, you're likely going to be challenged. Um, the other thing that I would consider that's one of the things, this is more of a learning thing than anything, is user error. Uh, GNSS receivers have very sensitive antennas uh, you know, on top of them or remotely mounted from them. Those antennas also need to be facing the sky with the best portrait of the sky as possible. Uh, thankfully, Flex has a uh, helical antenna, which has a lot of immunity to uh, its position as far as uh, it's located to the sky. But what you'll want to consider uh, with any GNSS receiver is make sure you understand what kind of antenna it's using and how it wants to see the sky because you can drastically improve or degrade your GNSS profile as far as what the receiver sees uh, simply by antenna orientation. So Nick, let's move on to the next slide if we could. So these are five of the modes that a GNSS uh, typically could operate in. Uh, Flex supports all of these. Recently, we made an announcement actually that the newest uh, iteration of Flex actually supports multi-GNSS, which means that instead of just listening to the GPS constellation, the standard version of our receiver now listens to as many constellations as it could hear in the sky. So what does that mean for you? Uh, essentially what that means for you is you have a really great sky portrait. There's at times 20 to 30, if not more satellites that you're receiving. So in situations where you might have tree coverage or urban canyons, uh, the GNSS engine has greater visibility into using satellites that are of higher signal strength uh, to calculate your autonomous positions, as well as use for other types of uh, position measurement. Nick, let's move on to the next slide. So the first mode of operation where we get some level of improvement is using satellite-based augmentation. I'm not going to go into a lot of the logistics because it's uh, there, there, we could have a complete uh, discussion on this, uh, this whole topic, but fundamentally with a combination of additional satellites in space and ground stations, the receiver such as a flex can get additional uh, information to improve the horizontal accuracy. So you're looking at a picture of where SFAST is available. There is uh, some experimental uh, availability also in the Australia region. Uh, but fundamentally, if you think about the United States, we're covered by the WAS, the Wide Area Augmentation System. Uh, that is actually going to allow flex to have a horizontal accuracy in the range of 30 to 60 centimeters. The other thing to be aware of is the reference frame. I'm going to talk about these a lot for each one of the modes of operation, but the reference frame for SBAS is ITF, ITRF08. Uh, typically, most uh, GNSS receivers in their most basic mode use WGS84. Uh, the difference between WGS84 and, and ITRF08 is actually only a few centimeters. So in the mode of SBAS operation, you can likely use either of those reference frames and get a very, very similar result because you're not looking at centimeters level of accuracy. You're looking at one to two feet kind of accuracy. So let's move on, Nick. 
now we move up into uh, the higher order of corrections, which is RTK or real time kinematics. And what this really involves is you using a receiver such as the Flex with a corrections network. The corrections network is a base station or a series of base stations set up in a virtual reference station mode that know where they are very precisely. And if you remember on the first slide we started, there's a lot of sources of error. Well, if I have two receivers, I could remove a lot of the error because I compare what one receiver is seeing against what another receiver is seeing and a whole lot of error goes away. So if you're using a flex in standard mode with a token to unlock its higher order uh, capabilities, or if you have an unlocked flex, which is an extreme flex, you have access to this RTK process. And, and what that involves is using your phone or tablet to connect to an internet stream service of corrections delivered to the flex. And with it operating in this mode, you can get accuracy down to one centimeter. And just so you know, the reference frame for what your corrections will be is going to be highly dependent upon the reference stations. For the most part, throughout the continental United States, we're all going to be in NAT 83 cores 2011. If you move up to a place like Canada, you're going to be using the Canadian Spatial Reference System. The one note that I'd like you to take away from this is when you are using a course, be aware of a couple of things. One, if you get much more than 25 kilometers away from the station, you're going to start introducing a good bit of error. Uh, and also be aware of that reference frame because this is where we get datum shifts. So Nick, let's move on to the next slide. All right, post-processing. Post-processing is something that's native also to the flex, which is the ability to record all the raw measurements. So imagine you're out in the middle of nowhere. You don't have access to a, a corrections network. You're not using L-band satellites, but you want to actually improve your, uh, your uh, positional accuracy. Metal Flex is capable of recording raw measurements and converting that to a format called RINEX. You can occupy a point, which means standing fixed uh, over a point for 15 minutes up to two hours and use a rapid static method of recording. Or you could do a very, very long term static, which is two to 48 hours uh, for even higher accuracy. Typically, what you're going to see in a 15-minute recording, if you have a good sky portrait, is a one centimeter level of accuracy, if not better, on the horizontal. And once again, the post-processing tool that you use is going to also drive the reference frame. So, for example, if you're using Opus, which is provided by uh, NGS, you're going to be in the NAT83 system. With post-processing, error is typically about 10 centimeters per 100 kilometers from the closest base station. So if you're very far remote to a base station, uh, you will be introducing error. This tool is very, very helpful, though, for situations where you have no option uh, as far as an external record or, uh, correction source. So let's move on from post-processing. And finally, that all flex has access to L-band satellite corrections. And what does that mean? So we talked about SBAS before, and SBAS is a form of satellite-based augmentation. L-band is one step above that. So if you're using a bad all flex token, you will have access to L-band satellite corrections. There's also subscription services for longer access in the form of months or years. 
essentially, as long as you're between 75 north and 75 south, somewhere on, uh, on the big uh, ball that we happen to live on, within about 15 to 20 minutes, you will converge on a solution that's eight centimeters, what they call R95 or 95% accurate, over four centimeters RMS. Uh, this is a really excellent tool that's actually used a lot in farming and provides a means to get higher accuracy in very, very remote locations. So you could be in Africa, you could be in South America, and actually be able to achieve uh, this four centimeter RMS kind of value. The thing that should be noted though, as I mentioned, convergence time takes a while. So your first position is not gonna happen for 15 to 20 minutes. And as long as you keep the orientation of the receiver towards the sky, you can move and have a really decent recovery between positions. For this particular correction service, uh, you should be aware that it is using ITRF08, and you will benefit by making sure that whatever you're using on the back end that's actually consuming the data is also working in ITRF08. Nick, let's move to the next slide. So there's a number of uh, items that are very important when, when we think about um, collecting data. Um, understanding your datums, coordinate systems, and projections is something that we really drive hard towards. Uh, your datum is actually going to specify a location on the Earth's surface. It might be in latitude longitude. It might be in northings and eastings. Um, just understand, you know, what, what it is that you are trying to consume. Uh, you know, the projections themselves also affect how your data is shown on a map, and we're going to go over that in a little bit. We also want to talk a little bit about the quality of your data, how we QA that data, um, be aware that the structure of your naming of fields is very important. You want things to be descriptive. And finally, you want to understand the source of your data. So let's move to the next slide, Nick. So just to be aware, uh, one of the most common things we see is why is my data off by a meter? And the simple answer is you look at typical NAT83 between NAT83 and WGS84, and that little shift in the six decimal point is, is 11 centimeters. And so what I'm showing you here on the screen right now is the exact same point uh, using a lat long representation of something that's in NAT83 and WGS84. That little bit makes a huge difference. Let's move on to the next slide. So here's some data actually from the field. So what we are looking at is some very highly accurate base maps uh, with uh, a ground control point target in NAD83. The base maps are in NAD83. And what you'll see is this is what it looks like if I put WGS84 data over the top of it. So I think we're trying to drive home the concept of please know your, uh, your datums and your projections because this is an AD83 map with WGS84. There's, there's your meter I was talking about. Let's move on to the next slide. We talked a little bit about authoritative data and understanding uh, your data. Something to also be aware of is base map data isn't always as good as you would like it to be. Uh, the free data sources that we get through, you know, Google and Bing and, and various other uh, services tend to only be within one to two meters. So as you're collecting data in a particular datum and projection, please be aware that sometimes that data is not going to line up precisely over your base map data. And this is an example of some very high precision 
uh, drone collected data placed over the top of standard base map data. This is, uh, this is something that you might have to explain from time to time as to why the hydrant doesn't line up or the store cap doesn't line up. So authoritative data, whether it be point data or poly data or base map data is extremely important in understanding how do I get all this stuff to line up on my final work product? Uh, Nick, let's move on to the final slide. I mentioned something uh, early along when it comes to QAing the data. One of the things that you'll have available to you with Flex is we stream the full NMEA stream down to many apps. And this is an example of using in a collector workflow. Uh, that would be Esri Collector. But the metadata that you collect with a GNSS receiver is really critical to the QA process. Um, I like to call it lineage, but the lineage of your data, what time and date was it recorded? What was the name of the receiver that recorded it? What was the horizontal and vertical accuracy? Uh, the DOP values, the number of satellites visible. All these additional pieces of information allow me as a consumer of this GIS information or this positional information into my GIS, uh, GIS, they allow me to make some really good decisions. So I would suggest to you as you're considering how you set up your GIS to really consume all the information available because if you're looking at your operational data compared to field data collected, you're really going to want to think about how do I QA this data so I know that my field data collectors actually produce a high quality product that I know that I could directly ingest without having to manu manually manipulate a ton of data. So Nick, I'm going to let you move on to the last slide. All right, thank you, Larry. That was awesome. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Uh, I appreciate everything you um, just showed us. And so being cognizant of everybody's time, we're right at about 30 minutes. And so I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that we will be giving away a new Bad Elf hack. If you are still attending this webinar and you live in the United States, go ahead and uh, if you are interested in winning a hack, go into the question and answer um, chat window and go ahead and say hello and you will be registered to win the cat hat and we will let you know here shortly. So here in the next minute or two, please go ahead and yep, I see people saying hello, hello, hi David, hi Rosa, hi Kenny, hi Samantha, hello everybody. If you are interested in winning a hat, please say hello in the chat window, okay. While those are coming in, we just want to spend a couple minutes. Um, again, we know everybody is uh, extremely busy. We just want to spend a couple minutes answering a couple questions um, about the geodesy topics that we talked about. Uh, Larry, I got a question in um, that I think you would like, I think you can answer. If you would, can you talk about how important pitch and roll of the bad elf flexes? and how that relates. How does orientation, pitch, roll, all of those things relate to uh, accuracy? Absolutely. So if you're using the standard antenna on a bad off flex, it's a helical antenna and it actually tends to be somewhat insensitive to roll and pitch. Now here's the argument that I would say against that. If you're really trying to record highly accurate positions, you want the antenna to be most directly oriented to the sky, so it's perpendicular to the sky. I guess that's the best way to put it. So essentially straight up and down. Um, the advantage to, um, if you're doing SBAS type recordings, for example, would be uh, you could have a field worker who might have the unit pitched over 15 or 20 degrees uh, it's really not going to affect an SBAS position very much at all. Um, as long as they have the, the unit away from their body, 
that's actually the advantage of this particular helical antenna is that the roll and pitch effects that you would have with antenna orientation are, are better mitigated. Um, but it's not a good uh, workflow for centimeter level work. Larry, that's a good point. You mentioned centimeter level work. What if I have a bad elf flex and, and my normal mode of operation Monday through Friday is um, I need to go collect the locations of utilities in that sub meter world. Uh, do I need to, do, if I need just sub meter accuracy with the flex in a normal condition, do I, do I need to really, really worry about orientation or can I hold the flex in my hand and my phone in the other hand and go relatively confident uh, collect submeter. So in the submeter world, um, as I mentioned, the, you know, a flex is not going to be as sensitive to those those uh, roll and pitch kind of changes. And essentially, what I mean is, you know, leaning it over. Now, what's actually going to be is there's another form of uh, user error uh, that exists, which if your body is over the top of the antenna, then it's blocking the sky. So really what's more important is making sure nothing is blocking the antenna or it's far enough away from your body so that you're not shielding it. Um, there's actually another uh, question uh, in the chat channel that's very similar for some of our other uh, bad elf units, and that's what's, what's good advice for the smaller units, such as the GNSS surveyor, or the GPS Pro Plus. And, and so the same is true. The antenna is located under the LCD. And so you wanna make sure the LCD is facing up towards the sky and that as little as blocking that as possible. So optimally you wanna set a GPS receiver over a point and back away from it so you and any other obstructions are not blocking it. That's great. Larry, uh, I'd say we've got some other questions and we, we certainly will reply to everybody via email. So if you have a question, please type it in now. We will reply to every email, we promise. But I see one uh, that I'd like to quickly ask you about. Um, it's uh, David asks, is there a way we can do real time geo 12B, um, so geoid corrections, or do we need to post process the geoid after each data collection? Larry, could you talk about uh, where the Bad Elf Flex stands with that? So we've actually um, been working a little bit with NGS uh, in using uh, both the Geoid 12B and the Geoid 18 models. And so we're actually in the process of looking at how we would properly incorporate that into uh, bad elf flex so that we could do that automatically. So the science is there. Uh, the process is, uh, is still um, open to a debate as to where we do that. So what I would suggest is after this, please send an email to sales as to how you would like to consume that data because right now we're doing some requirements gathering to see uh, what makes the most sense for uh, implementing uh, orthometric height support. So what I'm hearing, Larry, is as of today, uh, you would need to post-correct it with the Bad Elf Flex or use a third-party software to do it. But it sounds like really soon we're going we're gonna to be incorporating those conversions uh, either within the app or the Flex. Yeah, it, it's definitely something that we're considering. We're just still kind of in that trying to get uh, requirements from users to make sure we uh, we would implement the right things. That's awesome. Yeah, that's one of the best things about Bad Elf. Um, you know, every product that we we've created over the years, the first thing we start with is listening to our customers. So. Larry, I really appreciate it. Um, I think this has been a good webinar. I look forward to our next webinar here in a few weeks. If you um, have attended today, we just want to say thank you. We know everybody's very busy. We also want to say, you know, please stay safe out there. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us at sales at bad-elf.com. That's sales at bad-elf.com. We will also be getting back to you with any questions that have been submitted. 
And uh, you can certainly follow us on social media. So everybody stay safe out there. Thank you again for attending a Bad Elf summer webinar and we'll see you again soon in just a few weeks. Thank you.